with these videos, we're aiming to create an online library where if you don't manage to come to Full Circle uh, or any of our events that we think are worth putting up, you can come uh, in your own time and look at this video and learn about the topic. Hello everyone, and thank you so much, uh, the Airwayfield team, for inviting us to talk today about trends and uh, you know, impact on the recap market. It's a pleasure for us to be here. So anyway, let's start talking a little bit about what we have seen in the past year, uh, what sort of things are we going move forward and what can we see as the future in behalf? So when we talk about trans impact on the cap sales, um, as everybody has experienced in the last year, um, well, the coffee consumption habits uh, have been uh, affected uh, for everyone. Of course, this is not only uh, impacting the one or two uh, categories, it's also impacting the decaf category. Something that everyone agrees is the fact uh, that uh, the coffee industry is extremely resilient. And of course, uh, well, the calf and coffee consumption keeps you know, uh, afloat even through the difficult times that everyone has experienced in the past year. Uh, one of the things that is uh, general uh, true is that uh, everyone in the world uh, kept the, you know, the cup of uh, coffee uh, and of course, they kept drinking at home uh, in different ways. In any case, uh, talking about decaf, what I want to insist is the fact that decaf is a sizable market. It means that it represents $1.6 billion uh, as a market value. The decaf market is growing, and we are projecting uh, or the figures that we have received are predicting a 5.8% growth in the next six or seven years. In Europe, uh, that consumption is equal to almost 23 billion caps per year. It represents a total of 12%. So it's a very important market and we cannot uh, forget the fact that uh, with the new you know, consumption trends, uh, people is trying and the industry is trying to revamp uh, the ways of drinking coffee. As we all know, uh, consumption at home has increased uh, dramatically, and we see a lot of opportunities in this decaf category as well. In the recent years, we have observed uh, grow in the category. Previous to the pandemic, uh, we were observing an especially the cap growth, which represented an average of 5% uh, per year. When we talk about a specialty decaf, uh, we would like to mention that we are talking about espresso-based beverage, uh, which is understood as a specialty decaf. Anyway, we observe a 5% uh, growth throughout the past uh, years uh, where we saw a huge uh, you know, impact from the hospitality sector. Obviously, after the pandemic, that has changed. However, uh, the decaf category keeps growing with in-home consumption. So single serve keeps to be one of the major um, aspects of that new way of drinking coffee. People in any case want to enjoy all day long their cup of joe, and that uh, shows that dual drinkers as well are you know, demanding more and more uh, high quality premium coffee products where decaf again is no exception to the category. So here we can see the European coffee consumption uh, in growth uh, versus other years. So you have the total coffee consumption, the total of regular coffee here, and the calf, which shows that uh, pace of increasing throughout the several years where we have. Here we have the blue line where the decaf specialty keeps 
what was uh, you know showing a, an important increase until the pandemic. However, it's uh, showing the same average in terms of uh, growth if we compare with other uh, regular cohorts. As I was mentioning before, across all formats, the single search category is the one that has been leading the trend. We observe that, um, uh, well, the, the growth in comparison to other years is dramatically and is huge in 2020 uh, because the home consumption again. The single serve category uh, with new products like uh, capsules, like uh, you know more equipment that people were using at home allowed to grow the category. We also saw an important uh, increase on brew espresso consumption with 93% more of, uh, you know, cups uh, per day that were consumed uh, in last, uh, you know, last years. So here you can see a different uh, lines, uh, a different trends. Here we have the blue line, which is the most relevant one for us, where we can observe uh, the increase I was talking about, it represents more than, uh, you know, 12% of the category. Interesting to see as well, um, other, you know, preparations uh, that are, were quite you know, flat. However, this is the one that is showing a, a solid result, which is not only for the cat, but it's also for other types of coffees. Instant, which was the one that, uh, that has been showing a decline throughout all the years, um, shows an important growth in the specialty decaf uh, segment. When we talk about specialty decaf instant growth, what uh, can be considered as an instant decaf uh, is uh, those coffees that are 100% Arabica and coffees that have been a process with a higher, you know, quality um, methods like uh, freeze dry or coffees that also include some sort of micro roasting. So that is considered as a decaf, uh, an instant decaf category. So here you can also see the trend. And what is interesting to observe is that it's one of the categories that is growing among the instant coffee space. In terms of consumer trends, uh, well, trends emerging from the pandemic uh, show that uh, people is trying to reduce or to focus on more functional beverage. That of course applied to coffee where people is trying to reduce the caffeine intake. People are trying to be more healthy. And that is also another aspect during this pandemic uh, with all the issues and all the things that people are reading uh, better for you products, of course, will support the, the, you know, the rational and the interest of consumer for health oriented products. So that is also supporting uh, our category. Sustainability, which is another important aspect of the consumer trends. We have seen that a lot of consumers have prioritized and dedicated resources in those products that are committed to a social responsibility. Uh, those products that have uh, you know, evolved or that are part of the environment and, and fair trade practices are, are one of the products that everyone are observing as huge uh, increase in the category. So for us, this is extremely relevant because we feel part of a sector where we are fully uh, fully committed uh, with the sustainability and with a good for you product. We are not against the coffee category at all. We are just trying to offer an additional option in the afternoon and trying to provide a possibility for those clients that love to have coffee. Again, the majority of growth that we have seen in the past year are for drinkers that are uh, dual drinkers. We are not talking about exclusive decaf drinkers. We are talking about dual drinkers as well. In terms of consumer insights, um, well, we conducted a research 
and some of the questions that were asked were about uh, what is important when you are selecting your favorite brand of decaffeinated coffee. The majority of the consumers agree that taste is one of the most relevant aspects. As you can see here, taste represents 84% of the answer. So what we can see is that uh, premium decaffeinated products need to be consistent in terms of flavor and quality. They also want to have a consistent quality and they want something that uh, is pretty similar to the regular cup of coffee. Of course, chemical free process was part of the answer and sustainability uh, propositions are also extremely relevant for the consumers as we mentioned before. So uh, here at Sweetwater we feel extremely proud to be part of the category that values sustainability and good for you products. So when we think about what's happening in the decaf industry, the biggest change that happened is where people were drinking coffee. And so food service essentially dropped out. But what that meant was people still wanted to drink coffee. They were drinking coffee at home and it created a premiumization. We shouldn't have put such a complicated word in the presentation. <laughs> I'm gonna skip that word from now on. Um, and by that, we mean that people thought that they could have a more affordable luxury at home. So people could spend more. And that's part of what single cup coffee is. You know, you spend more for convenience and for the special experience. So what we've seen is that people started drinking higher quality coffees and they want coffee all day, especially for the people who aren't working in offices anymore. You have your afternoon coffee break or reasons to get up from your desk. And when you're working at home, you really need to force those reasons. So not only did we see the rise in single cup, but we saw a rise in consumption of coffee. You can go to the next. So in terms of raising the quality of coffee, we have a line of coffees, which we call the small batch series, and they're targeted to be very high-end decaffeinated coffees. And we saw more interest in these types of coffees from our roasters. Another neat trend that we see, which we've been trying to push forever, and it's really starting to come true, is roasters offering the same coffees as caffeinated and decaffeinated. So if you have a existing supply chain that you really like, uh, like if you have a cooperative that you really like, people are offering the same coffee, caffeinated and decaffeinated. It pushes the story that you have and it supports the supply chain that you have. But if you don't have customers who want a high-end decaf, you can't push that. And so that's been a nice trend that we've been seeing. But the next differentiation that we've seen is because of people selling direct to consumer, the D to C. So in my mind, a lot of roasters relied on their own cafes to differentiate themselves from other roasters. But if your cafe isn't there or your restaurant isn't there, what's making you different from any other roaster? And so people are bringing in a wider variety of decafs, which is fantastic. So one of the old myths about decaf is you just have one, you call it your house blend uh, and you don't say anything about it and it's just decaf. But this idea of bringing in multiple decafs and promoting them as if they're your standard offerings allows your customers to see more special coffees and to go in and buy these things. And so we saw this stratification where they're like, middle end of decaf kind of dropped out. Roasters were going either higher or lower. You know, you go lower to save money or you go higher to hit these people who are looking for the affordable luxury at home. We also saw a lot of growth in the grocery business. And this is again, it's like the direct to consumer, but it's for people who don't want to order online. You're ordering from your supermarket or you're getting uh, supermarket delivery to your home. And supermarkets and big brands more and more are moving towards sustainability. 
So we saw grocery brands moving more toward organic decaffeination, uh, organic coffees, and you need an organic certified decaffeination method if you want to offer organic decaffeinated coffee. And overall, just an increase in promotion. You know, uh, when you're doing direct to consumer marketing, you always need something to talk about. So talking about decaf was a great way, and we saw roasters doing that more than ever. Now, what have we been doing to keep up with all these trends? I, I think a lot. <laughs> so I'll touch on the trends and then what we've been working on. So we've seen an increase in growth. As the consumption pointed out, specialty decaf is growing faster than other segments of the coffee industry. So we, for a few years, have been working on building a new production facility. So we have a new plant where we're sitting now, and it's... Uh, running great and the coffee tastes great coming out of here. We also restructured some of our departments so that we can have some better efficiency and effectiveness with our response time and getting in contact with our customers. In terms of coffee quality, we have increased offerings for our small batch series. And this is fantastic. And I think this is the real trend in decaf is people selling decaffeinated coffee the same as they do with every other coffee, talking about the farm that it's from, the cooperative, telling the story, explaining why this coffee is really special. We've seen the growth in other formats, especially the instant specialty coffee. So we have more and more customers who are doing that and offering that around the world. Of course, we always push quality buying practices and quality production. This isn't so much of a news story for us. It's always what we're doing here, uh, but it's always good to remind people that that's still what we focus on. We don't focus on selling caffeine. We focus on coffee quality. And we've been focusing more and more every year on having coffee offerings that have sustainable certifications backing up. So we buy coffees which are organic, fair trade, Rainforest Alliance, Boots, 4C, Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. And, you know, if you have another certification that you want coffee decaffeinated from, we'd be happy to look into that as well. Um, it means a lot to have someone else verifying your coffee. So we uh, fully support these things and we'll certainly be doing more and continuing to grow in the future. Now, if we have to look really far in the future as to think about what's going to be happening with decaf, these are some of our guesses. You know, we'll see what comes true. Uh, but we think that people will continue to push the marketing and education of quality decaffeinated coffee. Not so much talking about it as something that's separate from the, the rest of the coffee industry, but just part of the coffee industry. Decaffeinated coffee is still coffee. As brands care more and more about clean labeling and explaining to their customers what's going into their products, we're going to see more consumer awareness about what's used in the decaffeination methods. We're already seeing some of these functional beverages come up, but we think that we'll see an expansion in the category of functional beverages, whether it's uh, modulated or regulated caffeine content so that you can be drinking products longer throughout the day or uh, having something else that's functional inside of it as a medicinal purpose paired with coffee. We think that's going to continue to grow. And at least in North America, having coffee blended with CBD is already starting and we think that that'll come up some more. Going to continue to see the premiumization of coffee, continuing more with direct to consumer, even after cafes and restaurants come back, people really have strong uh, buying practices and they get stuck in their ways. So the direct to consumer is going to continue and we're going to keep pushing quality coffee like that. Going to see more of the clean labeling, better for you choices, continue to see third party certifications for sustainability. And overall, more and more with single cup, people want coffee to be convenient, but they also need it to taste good. So potentially more 
decaf in those single serve and specialty instant categories. And if you ever have any questions for us, please get in contact with DR Wakefield or with us directly. We're always happy to help. And uh, if you need more predictions, we can open up our crystal ball and try and figure out what else is going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Great. That was great. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and now we'll just go ahead and get um, them back on so that they can uh, go ahead and introduce themselves a bit before we go to a bit of uh, Q&A. So if you would like to introduce yourselves and kind of, you know, what you do, just a little bit about yourselves and give the, give the audience a background, that'd be great. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Diana. So hello everyone, my name is Marisol. I've been uh, joining uh, Swiss Water for the past 10 years. Um, I am now the managing director for trading and development. Uh, before coming to Canada, I was based uh, in Tokyo and I was working for another coffee company, uh, the Colombian Coffee Federation. Um, and yeah, uh, now it's up to you, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. My name is Mike Strong. I'm the director of coffee here at Swiss Water. I've had the good fortune of visiting uh, the DR Wakefield office previously, so it's nice to see everybody. Uh, and yeah, I, I drink coffee, I occasionally buy coffee, but mostly I just drink coffee. Amazing, thank you very much. Okay, so we've actually got a question up from Jamie, which is uh, one of our colleagues here. Uh, and what Jamie's asking is with a small batch series, are you finding any kind of favorite origin amongst the roasters? It's the first question, we'll go for that first. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's, I would say that it's uh, natural processed Ethiopian coffees. It's a bit of a surprise because, you know, the price level of those really nice, fruity, intense, distinctive Ethiopian coffees, you know, it's kind of anathema to the old idea of decaf, where people just want a decaf that's like really plain and really affordable. And to me, it's fantastic. It, it really represents where decaf can go because people want a unique coffee and they aren't so price sensitive. Um, mm. and yeah, that, that's what we're seeing the most success with because people can really grab onto the flavors. And in that sense, um, when you look at kind of what the preference of the roasters, are you guys noticing any difference in within the world? So like, is it is there a region that prefers, let's say, a more kind of natural Ethiopia and then another region that might prefer kind of when we're looking at the kind of what tastes like coffee coffee do you notice any differences in trends across you know the globe in terms of the really high-end coffees like those small batch series no we're not seeing a big difference um i think it it seems to be pretty universally accepted what tastes good and unique tastes good and unique there's definite trends seen on the non-super high end mm -hmm. uh which you know that it's not specific to decaf it's just you know the different trends are different around the world um, but interestingly the the last coffee that we ran for the small batch series was an indian coffee and indian coffee is not very popular in north america um, so when we were selling it here everyone's like oh what's this new origin we've never heard of high-end coffee coming from india but like the rest of the world's like oh yeah we, we know that that exists uh, so that was a fun one for us. And we like to try out some different unusual origins. Sometimes it's successful, uh, like this Indian coffee. Everybody was really excited to try it. But I remember we, we had a coffee from Zambia, and it was, it was almost too far out there where people weren't quite uh, ready to, to jump in and try something new that was that unusual for them. Fair enough. And then I guess with the, with the non- premium not these kind of not small batch um what, what sort of trends have you noticed in terms of kind of preferences across the world and roasters and then do those follow the similar trends to what people like in non-decaf you know uh, coffee or is it a different is it like a flavor that just people tend to like or what have you noticed well uh that is an, an interesting question and basically depending on the type of you know geography where you are located, uh, people will try to find 
the same product and that's what we have seen in the past years, the same conventional regular coffee, they want to have the same product as the caffeinated coffee because they realize that, uh, well, the coffee mm, tastes almost similar. So just as, as an example, uh, for example, in um, Japan, um, some roasters, uh, they are sending uh, their coffees here. So they usually serve, um, I'm putting just an example, Honduras Organic, right? And they wanna have exactly the same lot that they have been using uh, for conventional coffee. They wanna serve the same Honduras Organic, but the decaf version because people would like to try the same cup of, uh, of coffee, but decaffeinated. In other parts of the world, uh, let's talk about, uh, for example, Spain, uh, there is still the conception that um, Colombia Supremo is a little bit higher in terms of quality, right? Um, having a lot of Robusta blends over there, Colombia Supremo is perceived as a higher uh, quality uh, and they are demanding more and more uh, Colombian Supremo decaffeinated coffee because it's the majority of the products that they find in the, in the shelves. Uh, now, as we mentioned before, uh, there is a new trend in terms of sustainability and that is led by young generation. In the States, the millennials, they are looking for products that are certified. They know that they can find different uh, origins. Uh, you can talk about single origin or you can talk a blend or a blend but they want to see if there is uh, an also uh, certified uh, link to the product that they are drinking. So they look for sustainability, uh, good practices and you know, support to farmers. Uh, and yeah, of course, the calf is, is one of the options. And again, it's not about uh, the decaffeinated uh, product itself. The conversation is more about coffee and dual drinkers, people that really like coffee, they want to enjoy the same cup of coffee in the afternoon, but without the jittering of the, of the caffeine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you showed on that slide, like kind of 84% were saying it was about that kind of best taste thing, which is, which is really quite, I think it's quite enlightening in terms of the fact that people choose to drink the coffee, not because of the caffeine, but actually because they want to taste that, that you know, have that flavor per perspective, which is great. And I guess the question then would be like, is there any particular origin that seems to produce more favorable quality in terms of flavor and consistency post-processing? Uh, that is a question we get frequently. And it's kind of like children, you know, you don't want to pick uh, one over the other. <laughs> uh, I would say that we do get good results no matter what the origin is. Uh, you know, if I'm going to personally pick an origin that I think is very consistent, uh, I mean, it was mentioned in the last presentation by, by Henry, there's really solid supply chains that we've been involved in for a long time in Peru, which I think just deliver on a really high level consistently year after year. Uh, and we see a lot of people wanting Peruvian coffee as a decaf, partially because of the long harvest time, long delivery time, so the coffee's fresh for a long time. But no, I, I wouldn't say that any one origin is better or worse than the other for results in decaffeination. I know. And I guess then with that, we've uh, it's actually been an interesting conversation that we've had and, and Jamie's brought it up here in the chat again as well as like when you look at kind of decaf and Robusta, I mean, we have a great talk happening tomorrow just looking at kind of how Robusta is pushing towards fine Robusta. And again, we have a really interesting movement happening within Robusta and considering how climate change in the world is moving. We know that these are things that are a real reality, but we also know that Robusta has more caffeine, um, it's probably different structure. So when you look at that, I mean, how does that differ in terms of processing with time, with, with in the detail around processing Robusta versus Arabica? Yeah, it's pretty much time, at least the way that our system works. Uh, Robusta has about twice as much caffeine as Arabica, which means it just takes longer to, to brew out, to, to extract the caffeine. Uh, the bean structures themselves are really quite similar. Uh, when we look at the physical statistics on the coffees, we don't see very big differences between Robusta and Arabica, especially with the nicer uh, cleaned and polished and, and well processed coffees. So the, the difference that we have in processing is really just we need to take out more caffeine and it just takes a little bit more time. Mm. 
Have you guys done any, um, like when you're looking at the processing and you look at, you've obviously got, you've got your wash and you've got your honeys, have you looked at like anaerobics? Because that's a, a, another new trend. Um, so in how that anaerobic translates then into decaf. Yeah, we've done a little bit um, just on a, a test system. We, have a, we can do a test to, through our lab. Um, you know, our minimum run size is about 50 bags of coffee. And so nobody has given us 50 bags of an anaerobic processed coffee to decaffeinate quite yet. Uh, that would be great if someone trusted us with that coffee. Uh, but until then, we've done little small tests and the coffee comes out great. It's similar to those natural Ethiopians. You know, when it's really fresh, really high quality, really distinct coffees, those flavors are maintained throughout the decaffeination process. Mm. Okay. Um, I've got another question from Jamie here and, and he's asking if there's any correlation between kind of SHG versus HG, so kind of hot or soft bean, if you notice any, any correlation or any differences and then like looking at natural versus washed and kind of do they bring their own challenges um, because of the differences? Yeah, they definitely do bring challenges. Um, so I like to think about our decaffeination process is really analogous to brewing coffee because essentially what we're doing is brewing the caffeine out. And so if you were gonna take a different approach while brewing an SHG versus an HG, because the SHG is more dense and it's likely going to be harder to extract the soluble solids, you're gonna to have to approach the decaffeination slightly differently, right? Um, but where these classifications always throw me for a loop is that once you get into really high-end coffees, those classifications don't matter anymore. You know, some of the highest end Colombian coffees that we see exported are exported as UGQ just to save money on exports, but they're, they're super high end micro lots. And so at some point we just, you know, we see the, the labels on there for the grades, but we can't put too much faith in those. So we take our own physical specifications and then base everything off of what the beans actually have in our hands. Yeah, fair enough. And I guess I've got, yeah, so um, Jamie was talking about a few years ago, Rico, they were looking at reprocessing using bacteria to impact flavor. So he's asking if there's any plans to look at any post-processing innovations in Swiss water. So, so um, if there's anything, kind of any thoughts around that. Yeah, it hasn't come up in a while. I remember that came up and uh, uh, it's, it's something that gets tossed around every so often, um, but there's nothing in the works for that uh, for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then with like, I was uh, just thinking also about that kind of slide and you're talking about kind of the, the move in North America in terms of the kind of CBD products. And I was just actually thinking, what is the opportunity there with regard to the decaf market and the kind of CBD products that are arising in North America? Yeah, it's, it's a funny thing, you know, it, it, because there's been regulations against having beverages that are caffeinated and also have intoxicants. Mm -hmm. And so decaffeinated coffee is kind of the way into this mm -hmm. um, because people maybe want that experience. And it's not like we're trying to push decaf as like a sleepy time type of thing to relax you and drink at night, but it's not going to amp you up. So it has kind of a natural bond with that type of product. Uh, we're, we're starting to see the development of these things. And uh, you know, it's a, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Definitely. We brought Henry on as well, just to have a, another a member of the, from the team, from the trade team, just because it's quite interesting sometimes to take some, some of the perspective from that since uh, they are the ones that see the decaf coming and going towards your grocery. So maybe hand over to Henry a bit and he can uh, chat a bit. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for the Good to see you. Um, yeah, well, I actually noticed, I wrote down in the presentation, you said that in the last five years, or at least from 2015 to 2020, there's been a 13% increase in like certified um, sales of, of decaf for you guys. Is, is that mainly split across one certification or is that sort of double certified coffee? And um, what do you think is driving that? Yeah, um, uh, well, uh, basically, the consumers are trying to find uh, more, uh, as I said before, certified coffees. 
and that is the, the new trend. Uh, there is no doubt uh, that, especially in Europe, uh, where the consumers before the pandemic, uh, they were much into trying to find new products and trying to find, you know, uh, double, triple, whatever certified, especially fair trade has been extremely popular uh, in places like the UK um, and uh, well, Eastern Europe is trying to get more spaces on that. Uh, well, we, when we talk about uh, the increase on demand of certified coffees, we definitely saw that in not only in the products that we are using here, but it's also because uh, the trade and the consumers are asking for that. Um, yeah, I would say that that's pretty much. I just forgot to unmute myself. Uh, thank you. And in, in terms of, uh, obviously you guys presented like a lot of um, data, which is always really interesting um, to see. We've seen quite a lot of data today across the various talks. Do you, I mean, in terms of, you talked about Europe and North America, even in North America, when, when you compare say the Canadian market to the, the, the American market, do you see many differences or are they quite similar? Yeah, I think in terms of the coffees that people want, they're quite similar. I, Canada is a little bit more of a filter coffee market, I would say, if anything. Um, but, you know, the, the trends are pretty, pretty close between Canada and, and the U.S. You know, they like the same certifications. There's the same brand awareness. So we don't see really big differences between those two countries. Not like we would see the differences between North America, Asia, or Europe. Yeah, it's interesting as well, because I mean, in terms of like, we, we've done quite, at the office, we've done quite a lot of blind tastings recently, both cupping, brewing, and on the espresso machine or decaf. We found that with certainly like having an espresso with the same coffee, decaf and Swiss water, sometimes it's, it's actually quite hard to, to tell the difference, whereas it's a bit more evident on the cupping table. Have you, have you guys found that as well, just in terms of like flavor? That's always the goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we taste every production as it comes out to do our quality assurance. And that's what we're looking for, to have similarity between the coffee before and after decaffeination, where our goal is to have a pretty transparent process where best case scenario is it tastes the same. So hearing that's really good. Yeah, I think generally as a talking of um, kind of how we're seeing the market develop, there definitely seems to just be more attention on, on decaf. And whereas maybe 10 years ago, it, it was pretty much just an afterthought for a lot, of, a lot of people. Now it's something which is seen as a product in its own right, which can drive sales and, and kind of, yeah, in, in, increase prosperity across the chain. Um, do you guys, I mean, for decaf, you've mentioned like Robusta here, in, in when you're actually... Um, processing the robusta obviously because because there's more caffeine in there is does it affect the process quite a lot um how you know does, does the factory have to adjust the time that it takes to remove the caffeine how, how does that work yeah as uh, mike mentioned before uh well the time is absolutely the most important uh, factor when we are processing robusta we also try to use uh polished, um, you know, products or clean products, which is hard to get, but we try to focus on uh, especially uh, Vietnam polished uh, Robusta, which is the best uh, in order to avoid a lot of uh, problems with our process. Again, time is the most important, and yes, we have to adjust uh, some variables to make sure that we extract properly the caffeine, and then that we get uh, the homogenization during the process. So that's pretty much what is important. It's important also to mention that uh, in the majority uh, of the cases, our clients are trying to look for Arabica uh, rather than Robusta. So the primary focus is on Arabica products. And do you, I mean, I've just got a question from Andrew um, talking about the, the goal of trying to replicate the decaf and the caffeinated coffee. Is, is it, does that increase time for extraction? Does it adversely affect the flavor on the Swiss water robusta more than say Arabica or is it quite similar? I would say that it's quite similar, even though it is an increased amount of processing time. Um, you know, we know that 
the more the coffee's handled and processed, the more likely it is to have flavor degradation. So we just keep as close of an eye on everything and uh, try and do our best. There's certainly, the, there's more risk, you know, the longer you're processing, the, the longer you're handling anything, that's a potential risk, but it's not like it's taking so much longer that the coffee is inherently getting damaged. We're not, we're not at a place where we're guaranteed to have reduction or destruction. Yeah. And, and does the green coffee extract, does it, does that change a lot with regard to Arabic and Robusta? Yeah, there's slight changes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can't say that it's exactly the same, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's nothing that we're not used to. We, we know how to handle these differences and we know how to move from one coffee to the other. So it's nothing that, uh, that we can't take. Yeah. And, and from a technical perspective, obviously you guys have, I mentioned that you've got a new factory, which is exciting. Is, is there any changes in technology that have occurred since the, the, the previous factory was built? That any new revelations or increases in efficiency or stuff like that? Um, well, of course, uh, uh, the new plant uh, uh, is improving uh, so many aspects in terms of time, uh, flow of the GCE into the different products that we are decaffeinating. And um, well, there are some improvements in terms of uh, drying process. Is that is that primarily just because you've had so much demand that you guys have you, you needed the extra capacity? What was the main driver for, for that? Well, uh, there are uh, different aspects, but of, but of course we needed to be prepared uh, to you know, ready needed to be ready for more demand. Uh, so right now. Uh, we are operating two plants uh, in Metro Vancouver, and uh, in a couple of years, uh, we will be able to have, uh, you know, uh, another line that will be ready for the extra demand. As you talked before, uh, we have seen uh, more and more, um, you know, clients trying to find uh, chemical-free, uh, premium quality coffees uh, decaffeinated, and we have to be ready. Um, the market has changed dramatically in the past years, as you pointed out, uh, Henry, and uh, the fact that the industry is trying to offer, you know, uh, products that are better for you, that everyone is trying to be, uh, you know, a little bit healthier, everyone is trying to understand a little bit better about uh, manufacturing processes, and of course, uh, the decaf category is not the exception to the rule. Yeah, absolutely. And Marisol, you mentioned how you used to work in Japan and the, the complexities of that market. How, how does that differ from the US and, and Europe in terms of like their trends and, and flavor profiles? Yeah, uh, well, uh, Japan and Asia are quite, you know, in general, in Asia, you find different uh, requirements, different perceptions. Uh, the Japanese market is a very interesting market where uh, decaf used to be, you know, observed as just uh, an option for pregnant women, uh, which is not strange uh, for the Europeans or the North Americans, but that trend was still quite, quite solely in the Japanese market. It has changed a lot. Uh, again, the industry is offering nice coffees and people is starting to see more and more products, big players in the markets are offering as well different preparations and that helps the category. On top of that, not only in Japan, but also in Korea, uh, there is a legislation uh, where uh, by principle, uh, you know, chemically decaffeinated coffees are not allowed. MC is not allowed into the market, which is good for us. And it's good for those that are into the chemical free processes. Uh, so uh, we have seen more interest. And as I said before, big players, big roasters are putting more uh, products uh, for the final consumers. And we are extremely now interested in, in other markets in Asia as well, where, uh, you know, uh, caffeineless or decaffeinated coffees are blooming right now. That's fascinating. And um... I was going to take this opportunity to ask if anyone has any further questions. I have one quick one, Marcel. Obviously, people have talked about consumption in China and how that might in 
the decade to come or in two decades might really increase global consumption of coffee. Do you guys have any ideas on what the decaf landscape looks like in China? Do you have any data on that? Or is it still a bit enigmatic in that respect? Yeah, uh, well, when I was uh, in Japan, I always heard like the you know Chinese market uh, was going to have an impact, a heavy impact in general in coffee consumption. And, I'm, and I've been waiting. Of course, the uh, Chinese consumers, they are extremely important and the coffee culture is getting there, uh, especially the expats and especially big cities where the westernized world is, uh, you know, uh, arriving quite fast. Uh, the calf, again, as part of the coffee category is not gonna be the exception, but it's still, there is a lot of things to do. Uh, we, we have done some, you know, um, promotions and there are some clients already interested in putting uh, decaffeinated products, but it still is in a very primitive stage, I would say. 